This is Whence They Came, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by Jack DeGolia. Chapter 1 The children have nothing to gain by making all of this up. That's been the crux of my argument for the past 17 nights, ever since they started reporting the sounds coming from the sky and the strange feelings that come with them. The civic directors have finally caved and agreed to a public meeting tonight, if only because they want to try to nip this in the bud before anyone starts thinking there's some kind of conspiracy going on. I don't think there is, but I also don't think there's not. I don't know what has been going on since the witness reports started coming in, but I do know there has to be something behind them. For one thing, there was no trickle, just a flash flood, an avalanche, whatever you want to call it, a sudden tsunami of reports saying the exact same things. I've heard from other teachers across the region, and some of their students started saying the same things on the same day. Sure, in theory, something like that could be a coordinated prank, but there are some kids in my classes who I would trust as much as anyone on the planet, and I know a frightened truth when I see one. There's one extra variable that I don't want to put too much weight behind, but I think it's worth acknowledging. I had the dream again last night. It's the only thing in my head as I make the short walk to school, where my students will no doubt be waiting to tell me what last night brought their way. More than a few of them have told me that I'm the only adult who listens without calling them crazy. And today I'm going to listen closer than ever so I can pass on every detail at the meeting. Now, I'm perfectly aware that the sights and sounds I've experienced in my sleep recently could have been subconsciously imprinted by all the things the kids have told me. Believe me, I know that. But on the other hand... I don't know. That's the recurring theme here, and it's the whole reason I've pushed so hard for a public meeting. I don't know what's been going on recently, and I think getting everyone together to say their piece and share their thoughts and experiences is the best chance we have of figuring it all out. The things I've sensed in my dreams are unsettling, but at least I have this mitigating idea that I might only be sensing them because I've heard about them secondhand. My students, though, they've heard the noises overhead with their own ears, and they've felt the chills on their skin. They've been awake when it happened, and they know they didn't imagine it. Some of them are excited, and most of them are scared, but none of them can soothe themselves with thoughts that they imagined it. They've been sensing something, because something has been there, and it's been coming back every single night. When I get into the classroom this morning, I'm all but certain I'll hear that more of the same happened last night. And when I get to the Civic Forum tonight, well, I can only hope we get some answers. I can feel the judgmental gazes from my fellow teachers as soon as I reach the school, and some of them hardly even try to hide their disdain. I'm the youngest by a long way, and I'm only in sole charge of a classroom while the senior teacher I usually work under recovers from his operation. If I was completing my apprenticeship to become a senior teacher in some engineering or science-related discipline, I wouldn't have even this limited time responsibility. The civic directors clearly don't care much about expressive art, though, so the classroom is mine for now. There are no judgmental stares when I get there, but the expressions I do see easily fill in the blanks left by the silence. More than ever before, I see fear in the children's eyes. E.J.? A voice quivers. I turn in response. They all call me E.J., keeping things light and informal at my request, and it's only then that I see Hal standing directly in front of the display board. Hal is one of my best students. Thanks to his father's occupation, he lives in a weather lookout tower. He's the only one who has been reporting sounds loud enough to positively hurt his ears. And we've all come to assume it's because of his elevated position, 
closer to whatever is causing the nightly sounds. Once Hal has my attention, he steps away from the board. I see a sketch that briefly impresses me with its excellence, but quickly starts to frighten me with its content. Is that what you think it looks like? I ask him. The thing making the noise? Hal gulps and shakes his head. Not what I think it looks like. EJ, I saw this last night. I walk closer to the board, taking in every detail of this, this, I don't even know, this flying triangle. The sounds have been getting louder and louder, but I had never seen anything until last night, Hal continues. I think this thing has been flying lower and lower. I think it's getting ready to land. Pip, a kid who is the same age as Hal, but hardly more than half his size, musters a question that the expressions all around the room suggest everyone else is wondering, too. AJ, are we going to be okay? I don't like lying to my students, but right now I wouldn't mind too much if someone older and wiser was to come along and tell me everything is going to be all right. Thanks to how willing you guys have been to keep reporting what you've heard, and thanks to what Hal saw and sketched last night, the directors can't ignore this, I tell them. So you don't think this is bad? Pip follows up. Hal thinks this thing is going to land soon, but you're not worried? I hesitate. If it lands, at least it's not going to catch us by surprise, and that's thanks to all of you, too. What I can promise you is that tonight I'm going to push the directors until they either tell us what they know or we're sure they don't know any more than us. But one thing is very important. Let me do the talking, okay? You know I'm on your side here. The directors might ask some of you some questions once I've made the opening remarks. But we have to respect the protocols of their meeting and not give them any reasons to dismiss our points out of hand. Are we all clear on that? I see a lot of nods and hear nothing but cooperative silence. This is the point in the morning when I usually tell them what page in their workbooks we'll be looking at, but it's taking me a minute to clear my head. I know I said I don't think there's a conspiracy, but that was before I saw Hal's sketch. Even more so than earlier. Now I know that tonight will tell me a lot. If Hal could see a flying triangle from his father's watchtower last night, it doesn't seem credible to think the directors haven't already heard about it from someone else. With all the sky watching they do to track the storms, they would have to have seen it. This thing in the sky is either something to do with the directors, at least something they've known about for a while, or it's something they'll be hearing about this morning now that it's finally come low enough to be seen. The more I think about it, the more I hope they've been covering something up, because if they haven't, if it's not something they know about, well, I don't think it's going to be something any of us can do anything about. Pip's first question rattles in my mind. Are we going to be okay? Page 62, I say, desperately trying to distract myself. I quickly realize this is easier said than done, what with a mysterious flying object possibly hovering high above me as I stand here. I glance to the display board again, at Hal and his sketch, then encourage him to take his seat. For another ten seconds, I can't take my eyes off it. Whatever it is, someone built it, and with each passing second, I grow sure that it wasn't our ineffectual civic director's. My back stiffens with the next thought, and I know it's going to be with me all day. Someone from somewhere else built that thing, and I'll bet they're sitting inside it. Chapter 2 Time is a funny thing. All through the school day it seemed to pass so slowly that I felt like I was going crazy. Compared to how this civic forum meeting has started, though, the morning and afternoon are starting to seem like they positively whizzed by. I got here early, and there was already a big crowd waiting to get in, composed mainly of youngsters who were glad the meeting was taking place, and their parents, 
who appeared furious at me for enabling and encouraging their delusions. That was the kind of sentiment I heard last week when I first went to the directors with my proposal for a meeting like this, and it really wouldn't take an expert in body language or facial expressions to figure out that I'm hardly Mr. Popular. He's an attention-seeking opportunist, someone yelled as I was taking my seat. A failed artist trying to drum up some interest and polluting our children's minds while he does it. It's hard to know where to start with that, because not one bit of it is true. Sure, I'd like to think of myself as an artist, but I didn't try to do anything with my skills besides teach, because I didn't want to do anything else. Failed doesn't seem fair, for that reason, and I don't know what purpose I'm supposed to be seeking attention for. It sounded like a very personal heckle, but without seeing the face the voice came from, I'm in the dark. I don't have any enemies to speak of. Until now, I've always just done my job and gone out of my way to keep my head down. But I suppose when children are involved, emotions run high. A glance at the time tells me it's only been four minutes since I sat down, which is hard to believe. The initial hubbub hasn't been followed by any more audible heckles, thanks no doubt to the authoritative presence of head director Vitten, who arrived just a minute or so after me. Vinton has been silently reading some notes since then, and when I say silently reading, I mean reading to himself in a room full of silence. I wouldn't have a hard time believing Vinton was older than the sky, and he's been head director since he was barely older than I am. He's the only leader any of us have ever known, and the hierarchical system he oversees is rigid enough to ensure no one speaks out of turn in his presence. I didn't actually expect that Vinton himself would show up for this meeting, and if I had, I could have saved myself the breath in telling my students not to talk out of turn. Even the occasionally rowdier among them would know better than that. Such are the tales of what happens to those who get on Vinton's bad side. I have heard stories like this passed down from generations gone by. Vinton says, suddenly booming his words out without any warning or introduction, in the arrogant way only an individual of unquestioned power ever would. They were nonsense then, and they are nonsense now, with the difference being that a teacher, of all things, has seen fit to gather us here to discuss them. In the public gallery I see parents shaking their heads in something close to disgust, alongside children with their shoulders slumped in disappointment. From Vinton's tone, it sounds like his mind is made up. Among his words, however, something jumps out. You say you've heard stories like this before? I ask. It's bold to direct any words to Vinton that aren't in answer to an explicit question. But both the urgency of the evening and the specific circumstances of my seat in the speaker's chair have emboldened me. The head director's gaze intensifies. Were my words unclear? He spits back. They lack context rather than clarity, I reply. I hear sharp intakes of breath all around, as though the watching public are uneasy on my behalf. Vinton says nothing, as though daring me to continue. Could you perhaps tell us about these old stories? I push. I wouldn't say Vinton's expression softens at this point, but it definitely changes. Since you've gathered us all here, I suppose we may as well be thorough, he says, clearly surprising his deputies with the relatively cordial tone. He goes on to tell me, to tell everyone, that stories of sounds and lights in the sky used to crop up quite often in the olden times, but apparently they were always told by individuals here and there, not with shared details across big groups like in the reports he's read today. This sounds promising, almost like he's willing to hear us out until he pivots and describes the recent deluge of witness accounts as a virus spreading among a student population that has been growing less obedient than any before it. As personally opposed to our political system as I am, and as sure as I am that it has outlived its necessity as a bridge between the chaos of the cataclysm's aftermath and the geologically stable present we're living in now, I have never sowed a single seed of dissent in any child's mind. 
My job is to teach them expressive art, and it's a job I embrace. This is all very different from anything I've seen before, Vitten says, speaking directly to me. Whether this is their collective idea of a childhood joke or a dissident plan seated in their impressionable minds to cause trouble for our administration, it ends tonight. And as the adult who has not only encouraged these students' misbehavior, but has amplified their voices to the extent that I could no longer ignore it, you will be held responsible and sentenced to... I saw it, a voice blurts out from the gallery. Everyone turns to see who it came from, but I already know. Hal. We've all been hearing it every night, louder each time, he goes on. But last night I saw it. It'll be back tonight, you'll see. Just come to our watchtower and... This time it's Hal whose words are cut off by the hand of his apoplectic and apologetic father as it covers the boy's mouth before he earns their family the same fate Vinton was all set to announce for me. Vinton's gaze flits between mine and Hal's. You're telling me you saw the source of the sound your classmates have been hearing? Vinton asks, the tone clearly one of surprise rather than anger. And that I would see it too if only I was to join you in the watchtower tonight? The triangle might even be visible from the ground, the boy replies, free of his father's silencing hand, thanks to Vinton's gesture requesting a reply. As Vinton turns to his deputies and quietly confers, I firmly conclude that the conspiracy idea is off the table. He was taken aback by Hal's revelation of a sighting, and even more so by the suggestion, the object, this mysterious flying triangle, would almost certainly be returning tonight. I didn't know what to expect from this meeting, and with a hundred guesses I would never have come close. I didn't really get to state any kind of case, and I was barely asked any questions, with Vinton apparently reading all he needed to know from the notes he was handed as the hearing got underway. I think that without Hal's brave intervention, this was shaping up to be more of a show trial than a public meeting. Vinton looked all set to make an example of me in a bid to quell what he apparently thought was some mischievous mass prank. But if the triangle in the sky was something Vinton didn't know about, that changes everything. In fact, it really brings me back to a concern I had earlier today. If the directors didn't know about this thing before today, it could well be a threat to all of us. It even seems like they didn't know about any overnight sightings right until Hal mentioned it, which makes me think the watchtowers aren't equipped with the kind of dark sky scanning technology I thought they were. There have always been rumors that the directors exaggerate our society's collective technological prowess, either to make us feel safer than we are, or make themselves seem greater than they are, but I always thought they had a handle on the sky watching, if nothing else. What I've read today tells me that parents are concerned by their children's hysteria, Vinton says, changing his tone to one that's fairly neutral. And it seems to me that it's time to put this to bed once and for all. If this is a hoax of some kind, it ends tonight. If, on the other hand, this is indeed a discovery of some kind, our understanding and our reaction starts tonight. Even in Vinton's overbearing presence, the public gallery erupts in a cacophony of individually low but collectively substantial murmurs. Talk of a potential reaction to a potentially, let's just say it, alien visitor? No one could have seen this coming. If the child is truthful and correct, Vinton goes on, focused squarely on me, he will be thanked and so will you. And if he is not, you will quickly regret wasting my time. As a reasonable director, I always leave a path for retreat. So the choice is yours as to whether you wish to press ahead with this issue or to never speak of it again. I look at Hal, who nods assuredly at me. Ahead we press, I say to Vinton. Does this mean you'll send a representative to the watchtower to record what the children experience, and if last night repeats, to see what passes overhead? Vinton shakes his head. No representatives, he says. I will make the trip to the watchtower myself 
and you will come with me. He rises to his feet, a move that takes more effort than it would have a decade ago, and claps his hands together to signal the end of this bizarre meeting. I know the score, though. I'm not free. Not yet. A lot is resting on whether Hal is right, and the alien triangle passes visibly overhead. But my personal freedom, my life even, doesn't strike me as the most important thing. I believe Hal, and I trust his deep feelings. So I know the triangle is real, and I'm all but certain it will show up again. To my mind, three things count more than any others. Who, if anyone, is inside that triangle? What do they want with us? And what is Vitten going to do about it? With night already upon us, we won't have to wait long to find out. Chapter 3 I've never been in this watchtower before, and to say it's less well-equipped than I expected would be an understatement for the ages. Hal's father is a cloud-tracking scientist, but it seems like his tools amount to little more than an elevated position and a small viewfinder scope. I don't say anything about this because it's hardly the most pressing matter, but all of a sudden I'm getting the feeling that we're going to be even less equipped to deal with any potential sky-based problems than I thought. Only three of Vinton's deputies have come with him, and aside from that, it's just me and Hal, along with his displeased-looking parents. I brought what looks like trouble to their door, and I'm regretful of that. But what Hal has seen can't be ignored. Our society is highly stratified along both economic and generational lines, with Hal's family being fairly high in the hierarchy thanks to his father's skilled work but with Hal himself being given little credence due to his young age. As a lowly art teacher closer to Hal's age than his parents, I have very little going for me. And if the triangle doesn't show up, we can switch out that very little for absolutely nothing. I try to think about my own situation as the night wears on, because it troubles me less than the other thoughts about our planetary situation. This sparsely equipped watchtower is a striking symbol of our rudimentary level of technological development, which is a story in its own right, and part of me can't help but wonder if the aliens inside the triangle know it. The story holds that before the cataclysm, our ancestors had at their disposal technologies we could only dream of. But with technological advances come advances in weaponry, and with growth comes strife. Their civilization destroyed itself, leaving few survivors to tell the tale. And our planetary ecosystem took untold generations to fully recover from the great detonations. What I can't shake is the irony that if we still had those weapons, we could defend ourselves against what could end up being a dangerous external threat. But perhaps that's the whole point. Perhaps the creators of the Triangle gave our planet a wide berth back then, and perhaps they're here now because we are ill-equipped to repel them. I spend several hours alone in the tower, mulling the possible fates of myself and my world, all while the rest of the small watch party stand on the balcony. They leave me to my thoughts, with no one needing to spell out the stakes again. I wouldn't say I'm resigned to anything, but the idea that... EJ! Hal yells. My back straightens like a shard of ice, and for a second my whole body is frozen. I quickly shake that off and run to the balcony, where the first thing I see is the collective awe on every other face. They're all looking at the sky, and it's a moment that will live with me forever. I slowly move my gaze along the line, right along to the usually unflappable head director Vitten at the far end. Only then do I direct my own eyes to the sky, where I see what they're looking at. The frozen feeling is back. Hal was right. We're not alone. Chapter 4 the alien triangle looks exactly like the one Hal drew in the classroom because this alien triangle is the one Hal drew in the classroom. 
like he predicted. It's back. In one sense, I know I should be pleased, because this is what we came here to prove. In a much greater sense, though, I already feel like we should have been more careful what we wished for. The triangle descends low enough for us all to make out some markings on its underside, but it quickly shoots off into the distance to leave nothing but a momentary blur in its wake. I alone remain frozen, my gaze fixed on the spot it vacated. In my peripheral vision, I see the others turning to face each other. I hear early speculation, and when Vitten surprises everyone by beginning to apologize to Hal, I can hardly believe my ears. Our head director is as shaken as anyone else by this, but he's only midway through his first sentence of contrition when a gasp escapes my own mouth to silence him. But forget my ears. All of a sudden, and all over again, I can hardly believe my eyes. It all happens in a matter of seconds. But my gaze was focused enough to notice the disappearance of the stars before my eyes adjusted to the colossal object that is now blocking them all out. It looks to be some kind of mothership, probably hundreds of times larger than the triangle. A series of panicked utterances bombard my ears, only seconds before my eyes are assaulted with yet another impossible development. All doubt as to the scale of the descending mothership is eliminated when a hatch opens on its underside and countless identical triangles emerge before shooting off in every direction. The hatch then closes as quickly as it opened, and the mothership sets off to our left. It's moving very fast. The visible markings and near-blinding lights on its base give enough points of reference to know that. But the object's sheer scale means that it takes a considerable time for it to pass entirely. I think it was coming down, Hal says, the first of us to speak. I think it was slowly descending to the left over there. This finally breaks my trance, taking my eyes from the stars I've never been so glad to see. I turn to Vinton, with no hint of I told you so in my mind or my heart, let alone my stare or my words. Now what, is all I can say. The head director, our unquestioned and unwavering ruler, looks not only shaken, but practically broken. Well, I push. Storm protocol level one. Vitten says. He's looking at me, but I get the sense he's talking to his deputies. I see their expressions change. Level one? One of them asks, as though seeking to make sure he hadn't misheard. Vitten nods. We need to get everyone on the planet underground, he says, right now. There's a sudden rush of activity, with one of the deputies physically tugging me away from my spot on the balcony and rushing me towards the stairs along with everyone else. Urgency isn't a strong enough word. I catch a glance at Hal as he and his parents hurry down the stairs following orders from the deputies. Vitten is right behind them, moving as fast as he can. If only the directors had paid any attention to the kids' common testimony when I first mentioned it, we could have at least been a little more ready for this. That's galling for sure, but it doesn't matter right now. The fact that there's apparently a secret underground base capable of sheltering everyone on the planet is also news to me, and feels like something the directors shouldn't have kept to themselves. But I'll chalk that one up as another thing to worry about later. For now, I'll take any shelter we can get. Because right now, only one thing counts. Whatever is happening, we have to survive it. Chapter 5 in this whirlwind of a night, nothing should surprise me. But the scale of this underground shelter system, how could it not? I'm down here in a shelter near my home with hundreds of others who also live nearby and were just as shocked when a team of junior directors opened a hatch in the ground and let us down the ladders. It already feels like we've been down here for days, but we're actually only halfway through the morning. I have no idea what has been happening on the surface, only the terrified and often fractious discussions we've been having down here. The two junior directors assigned to this bunker quickly became targets of the public ire, with the parents who disbelieved their own children suddenly flipping 
to lambast the directors for not having listened. It reached a point where I had to step in and play peacekeeper, reminding the parents of their own suspicion and encouraging them to be glad we at least had some semblance of shelter for now. The shelter in itself is a contentious issue, with so many resources clearly having been directed to its construction. But right now, I'm just glad it's here. Would we already be dead if it wasn't? Can we outlast whatever is happening on the surface? These are the kinds of questions rattling around in my mind, but I know better than to worsen things by voicing them and instead decide to leave them where they are. My dearest hope is that the visitors, who I don't want to resign myself to thinking of as invaders just yet, aren't going to use any massively destructive weaponry on our planet like our ancestors once used on each other. Everyone saw the mothership and triangles before we were brought down here, so we're effectively all in the same boat of knowing just as much as each other. This changes eventually, when a door opens and a senior director enters the room. He approaches the juniors who have been minding us and whispers something. The two juniors whisper something back, and a few seconds later, I'm called over to hear the news. I can't read minds, but I can only assume this is because I quelled the growing rage against these directors when it threatened to spill over, perhaps cementing myself in their minds as someone worthy of their trust. I turn away from my neighbors, knowing that I probably won't be able to control any change in my expression when I hear the news, and keen to avoid letting anything slip if it could cause further panic. Immediately, I'm glad I did this. The news is big. One of the triangles crashed straight into a watchtower, and it's currently being studied in another underground location. This news is big, but what comes next is even bigger. The mothership has landed and it has released other things. Things is the word the director uses, and when I query it, he tells me that they were first described to him as monsters, and that others are now referring to them as giant bugs. Giant bugs that are stepping in our buildings like we could step on a real bug, the director continues. My mouth feels dry, and my eyes grow heavy. Just like that, I realize I can no longer kid myself that these are visitors rather than invaders. What's going on? Hal calls, standing among the rest of the locals who live in our area. I encourage the director to tell them, saying the time for secrets has passed, and by now he trusts my instincts as a go-between. He tells them what he told me, then quickly adds the earlier part about the triangle that's being studied to give us an idea of what we're dealing with. You should go with them, E.J., Hal says. Make sure everything is straight. I like the kid, but I don't exactly feel like thanking him for this. The directors look at each other, quickly agreeing. It seems like anything to maintain order and morale is in vogue, which makes some kind of sense given how much tension is in the air. As I'm getting ready to leave with the senior director, barely having a chance to wonder how things have spiraled so quickly, I hear another question... This time it comes from Little Pip. AJ, are we going to be okay? I turn back around to face him and reply with the most reassuring words I can say with a straight face. This shelter is the safest place you could possibly be. He forces a brave smile as the senior director pats me on the back and leads me out of the bunker. I told Pip the truth and that's why my heart is pounding like never before as I walk through the door to see just what the hell is waiting for me. Chapter 6 All I can say is, wow. Yet again, and more so than ever, I'm utterly stunned by the scale of the shelter system. This time I'm taken to a small pod atop a rail on the floor, and as soon as the director and I are strapped to our seats, it whisks us across an untold distance. Things move by in a blur, and this is by far the fastest I've ever traveled, so I have no real idea how much ground we cover. Either way, we come to a sharp stop before long, and it's then just a short walk to our ultimate destination. I'm taken into the room without any fanfare, and I see head director Vitten 
standing next to the crashed triangle as a team of scientists examine its innards. Vitton turns to me, looking surprised I'm here, but also seeming surprisingly glad of it. Ah, EJ, they call you, isn't it? I nod. Well, this is it. It's not alive, and there was no one inside. We've never seen anything like this, but it seems to be some kind of driverless vehicle. An unpiloted machine. Perhaps a scout. For the bugs? I ask. Vitton gulps. Have you seen them? I shake my head. At this, Vitton signals to one of his deputies and the door is opened again. He leads me back out, setting my mind racing. As to whether I just revealed that I know more than I should. But a few seconds later, we're all climbing a ladder. You'll see from this tower, Vitton says. And sure enough, we emerge from a ground-based hatch right next to one of our hundreds of watchtowers. I look through the viewfinder scope Vitton leads me to, and with the aid of its magnification, I can clearly see the bugs. They're impossible to miss, probably almost as big as the triangles and so much more unsettling. They have long legs and a single round eye in the middle of their heads, which are also effectively their bodies. Just heads and legs, that's all they are. Worst of all, I can see that some of them have indeed trampled over our buildings. Every single one has made its way to a water source, Vinton says. We don't know what they want with our water, but we know it interests them. And as for the mothership... I follow Vinton's finger, and this time there's no need for the scope. In the distance, I see a mothership so large that it almost defies belief. It avoided our oceans, Vinton says. I look around. And it also avoided our cities, I say. It landed on the plains when the cities cover almost all of our land. That can't be an accident. Maybe the bugs are machines, too, out to analyze the water, and maybe some of them stepped on buildings by accident, or at least just incidentally. Because look at the size of that ship. If they wanted to crush the cities, well, the cities would be crushed. Vitton raises a hand to his face, striking a pensive pose. So you don't think they're hostile? Seriously, how did it come to this? How am I suddenly the one Vitton is turning to for answers and in our planet's darkest hour? All I did was listen to the kids and put myself on the line, but the more I think about it, the more I can understand why that's made such an impression. The hierarchy is such that no one puts themselves on the line, and I guess the fact that I was diplomatic after being proven right has gone down well with him, too. I don't know that they're hostile or here to stay, I say. If they are, we're dead, obviously. I mean, look at what they have at their disposal. But if they're just here to scout, and if they're indifferent to us, maybe we could do something to make them be a little bit more careful not to crush our world to the ground. These things do look like giant bugs stepping on our homes, but maybe that really is just like how we could step on a bug's home without thinking anything of it. Maybe they don't know we're down here having discussions, having thoughts, having feelings, you know? Maybe they don't know, and maybe they would leave us alone if they did? Hmm. I don't know if I even believe myself. It's not like I'm trying to convince Vitten of anything. I'm just trying to make sense of it all. What I know is our world hasn't been destroyed, and that by now the mothership could have caused as much damage as it wanted to. The fact the bugs have all headed for water sources could be the big factor here, I think, because it seems to rule out the idea that they're here to cause harm, or at the very least, that they're only here to cause harm. They want something else, not us. So you think you could talk to them? One of Vitton's deputies asks me. I gulp. I didn't say that. Or at least signal, another adds. If you stand in front of them, we'll see how they respond to you. We don't know for sure if those things have drivers or if they're unpiloted like the triangles, but getting up close could be one way to find out. Sometimes gulping isn't enough. I now feel like my throat is tightening like a vice. The thought of standing before one of the bugs is so horrible, I can't even believe I'm hearing it. Vinton looks at me. I don't want you standing in front of one of them, he says. 
Sense wins the day. Thank goodness for I want you at the mothership, he adds. My eyes widen. The mothership? We know they have to be in there, Vinton says. If they see you, we'll get some answers as to their intentions and feelings towards us. If you can somehow make a case or make an impression on them, great. If they are hostile beings, sneaking up unseen could enable you to spot a potential weak point in their mothership. We don't have much at our disposal, but we don't have nothing. My mind is racing like never before. I hardly even follow what they want from me. So you want me to sneak up to the mothership, I begin, hoping to make some sense of it, to find a weak point in case they're hostile, and if they see me, you want me to try to communicate, which only works if they're not hostile. Is that right? Yes, he says. Initially try to sneak up and report back. We'll continue to monitor the bug's movements, and if hostility is suspected, we could attempt some kind of attack based on the intelligence you gather. If you cannot go unseen, you are authorized and encouraged to attempt to communicate. That will work if they are moral beings and may work if they are largely indifferent. For everyone's sake, and yours most immediately, I hope they do not see you if they are hostile. The words are blunt, but this is the hierarchy in action. However much Vinton clearly trusts me, I'm still the expendable one. This is also the system in action. Decisions being made with no input from anyone outside the civic director's bubble, subject to no scrutiny and beholden to no firm rules of logic. Before I know it, I'm being ushered back to the transport pod on the rapid travel rail. When it stops, this time after an even longer journey, I can only assume that I'm standing right underneath an alien mothership. Needless to say, this is closer than I ever wanted to get. But, needless to say, I'm not done yet. Chapter 7 Even today, after all that's happened since last night, nothing could have prepared me for the scale of the object that confronts me when I ascend the ladder through a small hatch in our planet's surface. This time yesterday, I had no idea there was anything under the ground, let alone that vast numbers of trapdoor-like hatches could be opened to allow entry to an almost endless system of tunnels and bunkers. More to the point, though, this time yesterday, I had no firm idea that aliens from other worlds existed and no reason to think I would ever be in the shadow of a gargantuan mothership. It's impossible to size it up, but I think its footprint is bigger than the city I live in. When I looked from the watchtower, my city seemed to have avoided any bug-caused damage, likely because our area has no lakes or other water sources to attract them. I'm hopeful the beings aren't hostile, but I act with the care of someone assuming they are. I keep low as I climb up from the ladder. The hatch doesn't close behind me. The directors haven't made that order, at least. They haven't completely thrown me to the wolves. With the mission in mind, I look for potential weaknesses in the mothership. I have no means of contact with anyone else, so can only act on my own volition. When I mentioned the size of the mothership in reference to its footprint, footprints might have been a better word. This thing has legs as far as my eyes can see at frequent intervals, Maybe so it could have landed somewhere like the city without risking any damage to its main body. Once again, I try to take the fact that it could have landed over the city as a good sign. It could have, but it didn't. But as for those footprints, before long I see an opening on the base of the ship right next to one of the legs. The legs aren't all that high compared to the mothership as a whole, and they have ridges that will enable me to climb. I know why I'm here, and I have to try. With that in mind, I grab on and climb, quickly surprised by how easy the frequent ridges are making it. I don't look down, I know better than that, and sooner than I could have reasonably expected, I'm looking in. I peer over the floor, looking primarily for signs of motion. I see none. The hatch is fairly big, and certainly a lot bigger than the ones on the ground that lead to our bunkers. Whatever it's for, I think, 
Aha! Instantly I see what it's for. Releasing the bugs. I know this because there are several of them against the sidewall of the cavernous room which is filled with materials and objects the likes of which I have never imagined, much less seen before. The bugs, to my surprise, are open. Each has a hinged door, clearly to allow a driver to get in. And that answers the question of whether they're monsters or machines. But wait, doesn't it also answer another question? Some of these machines trampled our buildings as they headed for water, but if someone was driving, that means the machines weren't automatically following a straight-line route. Their legs are long enough, and their feet small enough, to have avoided causing damage. So the fact that drivers didn't care is seriously tempering my expectations of appealing to their good natures. Vinton's words rattle in my mind. Look for weaknesses. So after waiting silently a little longer for any signs of life, I decide to go for it. I've come this far, and I go a little further, by hurling myself onto the floor of the mothership and hurrying to the nearest bug. I climb its leg without thinking, which is harder than climbing the mothership's leg, even though it's so much shorter. This leg is maybe only five or six times my height, but the lack of ridges or anything else to grab onto makes it a real challenge. Nevertheless, I make it. When I peer into the inside of the bug, I see a seat made for a being much larger than me. What strikes me is the size of the headrest. It's huge, even relative to the rest. I see unintelligible symbols on buttons and dials, and all kinds of instruments like nothing I've ever seen. I now know for a fact that these are vehicles. So I'm starting to think the triangles were the scouts, sent out to find water sources, and then these ground vehicles were the alien's way of getting there. The other thing I've learned is that this door is open, paving the way for any weapons the directors might have to be directed here. I say any weapons the directors might have, because frankly, I have no idea what they do have. I knew nothing of the bunker, so I'm trying to be hopeful there might be some weapons I don't know about. I don't see any other doors in this room, and I'm already pushing my luck by being here, so I slide down the bug's leg and climb down the much longer leg of the mothership. After that, the steep ladder down to the bunker seems like a piece of cake. The hatch doesn't immediately close behind me, and only when I look up do I get a sense of how high I climbed. Well? Vinton asks, waiting at the bottom. I tell him everything, that the bugs are vehicles, that the aliens are much bigger than us, that the door is open. He takes all of this in and ponders it. What kind of weapons do we have? I ask, particularly in terms of explosives. Vitten exhales slowly. We could certainly take out the bugs you found in there, but I don't know what good that would do. We have explosive devices, but nothing you don't know about. There is no secret weapons program. Nothing like the olden times. Can we fire them? I ask. He ruefully shakes his head. Not with enough power to do any meaningful extra damage than we could cause by placing them. With what you're telling me about the bugs, about them being willfully driven through our buildings, I believe we might now find ourselves in a situation of greatly asymmetrical warfare. Even if they did not set out with the explicit intention of hurting us, it seems that they do not care about us, E.J. That is what it seems to me. As we speak, they are marching across our cities, clean through our schools, our homes, our hospitals. I can't disagree. They don't seem to care about us. But looking up at the trap door, an idea enters my mind. What? Vinton asks, seeing my mental gears turn as my eyes widen. I'm just thinking, I begin, if they care about each other, maybe we could try to get ourselves some leverage? It takes a second, but Vitten's eyes widen almost as much as mine. If we can open one of our hatches when a bug steps on it, we can trap one, I say. If they don't leave soon and we want to get their attention, that's one way to do it. It's the way to do it, Vitten decisively insists. And with every minute they are causing harm, that will take years to undo. 
when already we are struggling with resource shortages. Our population is safe underground for the moment, but if we wait even a day in the hope these invaders will leave, we may well have no world left to sustain ourselves. With what we know and what I see, hiding is no longer an option. I look around the room at the other directors who are waiting for my return. No one says anything, but I think this can now safely be taken as a sign that they don't disagree. Yesterday, it would have meant nothing since no one ever spoke against Vitton's viewpoint. But circumstances have long since pierced that bubble, and the head director doesn't seem to mind. So the plan is to trap one, I say. And then? Vitton looks at me, then gazes upwards through the still open hatch and the mothership overhead. Well, E.J., then we see what happens. Chapter 8 Outmatched by an invading force, I suppose a primitive ground trap makes as much sense as anything else. The logic and the hopes of what might come next get muddier beyond that headline idea. But when you have one way forward, there's not much choice but to take it. While the directors work on coordinating this mission by utilizing watchtowers across the planet, I'm asked time and again to describe the bugs in as much detail as I can. I relay the size, especially the lengths of their legs, and it's quickly established that all of the shelter system's trapdoors are large enough for this job. Each leads to a room that can be completely enclosed, with walls and ceilings thick enough to withstand the apocalyptic storms they were built to protect us against. There are a lot of trapdoors, to be sure, but they are scattered quite far apart, and their aggregate size covers only a tremendously small percentage of our land. It's not like we can just open them all and expect a bug to fall in. And we also have to be wary of only striking when the time is right. We've closed the hatch under the mothership, and as it stands, the aliens seem to have no way of knowing the ground could open beneath them at any moment. Hell, I've lived up there and walked across one of the trapdoors on my way to school literally thousands of times, and never once did I notice anything odd about the ground underfoot. When I'm relaying details of the bugs for what feels like the hundredth time, something hits me. At last, something we found out earlier can come in handy. The bugs have all headed for water. I raise this point again, and it's quickly agreed that we can use it to our advantage. Schematics are delivered before long, and we look for trapdoors near water as a good starting point. With several identified and shortlisted, those are the ones we watch most closely. It's hard to know exactly how much time passes, but it's not long before a bug leaves one body of water, having done whatever it was doing in regards to analysis or extraction, and heads to another nearby. This was the one we had the highest hopes for all along, because the trapdoor lies directly between a large lake and a much smaller one. And because it was deemed our best hope, Vitten and I have made the rapid underground rail journey to the closest watchtower, and we're ready to see the moment of truth. In contact with a deputy beneath the surface, Vitten gives the order, Now! A moment passes in slow motion, and in a flash of chaos, the ground beneath the bug rapidly opens up as the hatch slides into its recess. Time stands still. I hope beyond hope that the bug isn't going to simply leap through the air or perhaps even fly to solid ground. It doesn't. Instead, it falls into the pit, into the trap we have laid, and the hatch Seals closed. Word comes from the bunker that the bug is upside down and unable to right itself. The deputies are seeing this through a thick glass window between themselves and the makeshift holding pen, which Vitton wants to see for himself. Before leaving the watchtower, I glance out to see if the other bugs have reacted to their comrades' entrapment. They haven't. But I stop short of drawing any conclusions since I don't even know if they'll be aware it happened. It's natural enough to assume that the drivers are talking to each other all the time, but I can't be sure they are, or that their signals would get through our bunker's deliberately thick walls. 
When we get to the window and see the bug, a piloted vehicle whose legs lack the dexterity to return it to an upright position, Vitton calmly gives a single word order. Detonate. I brace myself, and then it happens. Chapter 9 I certainly didn't expect to hear the explosion, but I do. Credit to the directors and the teams who constructed these bunkers, though, because I didn't feel anything. The explosion was powerful enough to send debris smashing into the window, which also held up, and it seems like the sound has to have been able to escape by design rather than by accident, either through some clever acoustic setup or some kind of signal relay. In any case, the explosive impact isn't the sound that will stay with me for the rest of my life. No. What's going to stay with me is the guttural scream of the dying alien, choking and gasping for breath as its vehicle's atmospheric seal is broken and its body is exposed to our clearly inhospitable air. Mercifully for everyone, the screams don't last long. The death was too quick to have come as the result of suffocation, I figure. It seems instead like the alien couldn't handle something in our air, something toxic to it, rather than being unable to live without something our air lacks. It was killed by the presence of something, not the absence. The bug is still largely intact, clearly made of strong stuff. This highlights how futile an attack on the mothership would be, but we were at least able to break the air seal. Now what? One of Vitton's deputies asks. Stumped, he turns to me. Me? It's on me? Again? No one else speaks, so apparently it really is. I would trap another one, leave the hatch open, then put this one back to the surface, I say. Show them we killed it, and that we'll kill another if they don't retreat. Their bug drivers are crushing buildings without a second thought, so I think a hostage is the only shot we have of leverage. There's no leverage in a dead one, but proof of what we can do adds to the leverage of trapping another. Hmm, Vitton says. It's just an idea, I go on. The way I see it is we're massively outgunned against a mothership that could crush everything on the surface at any moment, regardless of what we do with any more drivers we trap. So we have two choices. We can kill more and hope it scares away the mothership, which I think would be in vain. Or we can show good faith, maybe even trapping another two and releasing one at first to see what they do. Good faith? One of Vitton's deputies echoes, clearly incredulous. We don't know anything about them, I reply. And for all we know, they don't know anything about us. Maybe they did just come here to scout our resources or our planet without knowing anyone was here. Now they know we're here, and they're going to know we can kill more of their drivers. But if we try to signal that we're willing not to, maybe they'll show mercy too. Vitton stares right at me. E.J., your plan would have us counting on mercy? You know the stories of what happened to our ancestors better than I do, I snap. They didn't trust each other. They assumed the worst at every turn, and look where it got them. Look where it got us. Ten steps back in our development. Hiding underground with no useful weapons to defend our whole planet because our ancestors destroyed their societies by using their weapons against each other. No one says anything. So maybe instead of assuming the worst of these outsiders, we can at least hope for reciprocal mercy? Someone always has to go first, and I'm not seeing a lot of options. I feel like this makes a lot of sense, and I do mean the words, but I sense that they're not getting through when I present them like this. Fine, just focus on the other aspect. I sigh. We're utterly, totally, fatally outgunned. That's the cold, hard truth, and they know it as well as we do. Sure, they'll know we killed one of their drivers, but they'll also know we used a trap door against a machine that came out of the sky. They're not going to show fear, so if they don't show mercy, we're dead. And when you weigh this up, don't you think we're more likely to see some mercy if we show it first? rather than show ourselves up as savages by trapping and slaughtering another ten bug drivers first? 
everyone turns to Vitten. Trop two more, he says to everyone, and no one in particular. EJ has steered us right so far. I sense the others don't like it, but only one view counts. I take one of the deepest breaths of my life and follow Vinton back towards the watchtower. No pressure. Chapter 10 With the water focus shortlist at work, it doesn't take too long for us to trap two more bugs. When I say us, I don't mean Vinton and me directly. This time, the two bugs are a fair distance from our chosen watchtower, but fairly close to each other. At this point, Vitten wastes no time in giving the order to simultaneously raise the already decimated bug to the surface using a floor-lifting system that shouldn't surprise me by now, but still does. Immediately after dishing out that order, he calls for the hatches above our live catches to be reopened. From the perfect vantage point of our watchtower, I see every single active bug on the surface of our planet stop moving in an instant. They know. Whether by radio signal or whatever else, they know. One passes right by our recent kill, pauses to look closely, then continues on its way towards the two that can still be saved. So they know about that, too. They know what we're capable of. All of them begin marching in the direction of the two open traps, which are fortunately, I think, close together. Release one, I say. Vinton holds up a hand. When they're closer. I gulp and count to five. Still no order. Okay, they're closer. They're not getting closer to us, but by now some have practically reached the traps. No, Vinton decides. Immediately, one of the bugs is raised back to the surface. Just as quickly, the hatch that had opened to trap it now slides back into its closed position. Along with every other, the newly freed bug hurries to the trap where our sole remaining piece of leverage lies. As vehicles, none of the bugs have sufficiently dexterous limbs or appendages to help it out. The aliens inside are unsuited to our environment, as the dying guttural roar from earlier today can attest. And as such, there's no way this bug is getting out unless we want it to. They know that, I tell myself. They have to know that. I can't pretend I'm not doubting the plan. To the extent it was ever a plan rather than a hope. But so far, it has all worked out, and this was the stage it was all leading to. All of our hopes rest on two conditions. The first is that the aliens have a psychology even remotely compatible with our own one that enables them to make sense of what we're doing here. If they do, the second condition is that once we release the second hostage and surrender our leverage in a show of good faith, they will repay mercy with mercy. My hope is that they see us as worthy of more respect than they have afforded so far in trampling our buildings, not necessarily on purpose, but certainly without due care. A saying from the olden times comes to my mind, Vitten whispers, the words barely audible through a series of labored exhalations. It is better to die with faith than live without it. I hold his eyes and nod. Do it. Release, he booms, with more force and conviction in this word than any I've ever heard leave his mouth. And just like that, the remaining hostage is raised to the surface. I hold my breath. Last time, they all headed for its pit. This time, with no more pits and no more hostages, where the horde of beastly alien vehicles heads next will tell us everything. Seconds pass with no movement. Until the movement begins. With faith we live! Vinton yells, placing his hand on my shoulder and shaking it. With faith we live. Sure enough, they're retreating. Every single bug is heading back to the mothership. We watch them go, and I breathe an extra sigh of relief as the horde continues in its straight line past our position, now not only getting further from the trap and the partially trampled cities, but also further and further from our watchtower. 
At the very back of the pack is the bug we just released, moving more gingerly due to slight damage received in its initial fall. When it reaches the point in its path directly in line with our position, it turns on the spot and seemingly looks our way. And then it hits me. There's no seemingly about it. The rest are continuing to head towards the mothership, but it's not. No. Damaged by the fall and controlled by a driver who could be injured and bitter at those who caused it, the hellish bug is heading straight for us. Chapter 11 Should we drop it again? Vitten asks, his voice trembling as much as his body as the hulking bug stomps its way towards us. It's barely even registering anymore how weird it is that the head director is asking me anything, let alone what to do in these moments of unprecedented planetary emergency, because that's just where this crazy incident has taken us. No, I say, that might bring them all back. This could be a personal vendetta, the driver wanting to get even with us. We can't risk everyone else, too. Vitten looks away from the oncoming bug and into my eyes. You would accept death for the others? Call me a fool, but I nod. He slowly inhales. Like faith, young E.J., it is better to die with honor than live without it. My eyes widen. He's on board with letting it come? I didn't expect this from Vitten. Not by a long shot. No funny business, he barked ordering his deputies not to open any trap doors. I look outside again. It's almost here. Without asking or even telling Vitten, I make a decision. EJ? He calls, shocked as I sprint away. I don't stop running, but I at least give him the explanation as I reach the ladder and descend. I'm going to face it and hope it feels mercy. If we saw the alien in the bug earlier, we might have had a harder time blowing it up. If this one sees me instead of a faceless watchtower, well, it's worth a shot. I get outside just in time, and the only other being on the surface for miles around is the alien in command of this bug. I hold my ground in front of the watchtower, staring up at the beastly vehicle. It looks taller than the one I climbed into earlier, and I think it is. Yes, definitely. The legs have extended. And just as I'm thinking this, they begin to retract. Lower and lower it comes until the legs ultimately fold inward and the body of the bug is on the ground. It's as low as it can get, bringing me as close to the driver's pod as possible. The glass is opaque from the outside, preventing me from seeing in. At least, it was at first. My mouth falls open and stays there as the glass becomes untinted, evidently at the driver's request, and I can see its face as clearly as it can see mine. The face. Where do I start? Without question, this alien being is the strangest thing I've ever seen. The first thing I notice is the first thing anyone would notice. It only has two eyes. Two. And then the skin. I'd call it a kind of sandy color if I had to describe it. It's staring at me, right at me, boring through me with those two lonely eyes. What can I do? I ask myself. Seeking mercy once more with nothing else coming to mind, I raise a hand. Its eyes seem to tighten, closing slightly as if it's trying to focus more clearly on something. For the first time, it hits me that it could be as taken aback by me as I am by it as shocked to see one of us up close as I am to see one of them. Does it think my smooth blue skin is odd? Is it shocked by my six eyes? Maybe even my eight fingers on each hand instead of its... instead of its... five? Two eyes on its head and five fingers on each hand? How did these things ever ascend to this level of technological development? But yes, five fingers... And I know that because it's now raising its hand the same way I have raised mine. Contact. We're communicating to an extent, and it's not crushing me like it obviously could. No, it's looking at me, 
And now that we have established some kind of communication with our hands, it's definitely trying to communicate more. Now it keeps moving its hand one way, quite slowly, then sweeping it back, over and over, time and again. Is it? Yes, it has to be. It's asking me to move aside. I move aside in the direction it requested, and as it steps beyond me and the tower, the realization finally dawns. It doesn't want us. It wants its fallen comrade, who is lying just beyond the tower. Of course it does. They care about each other, just like we do. Our psychologies aren't irreconcilable, at least to this extent. They understood our combination of a threat and an offer of mercy, and they respect their dead as we do. Whatever brought them here, they're not savages. They didn't land the mothership on our city. They did step on some buildings. But maybe the point I heard last night about them doing that, like we step on real bugs, was true. Maybe they didn't realize we are what we are. Maybe at first we seemed as backwards to them as real bugs are to us. Maybe they're only now seeing that we are advanced in our own ways, capable of standing up for ourselves in defiance and showing mercy in equal measure. I watch silently and without moving as some kind of magnetic force binds the broken bug to one leg of the recovery vehicle. That vehicle and its driver, some combination of merciful, forgiving, and pragmatic, then begin back towards their mothership with the broken bug in tow, moving even more slowly than beforehand. The driver stops in line with me and raises a hand. I do the same. And while I won't claim to know exactly what it's thinking, I do feel like we are communicating. In a smooth motion, the bug then turns around and sets off into the distance. I return to the watchtower, where Vinton says nothing and puts a supportive hand on my back. In truth, this says more than words ever could. One additional thing this has all taught me is that Vinton is a complicated individual like any other. In a position of unquestioned power, no individual should ever be granted, but perhaps also one that no individual should have to endure. It takes a while for the driver to reach the mothership. I watch through the scope as its bug finally disappears inside, with the broken one still attached. With no one left behind, the mothership then takes off, and our visitors depart whence they came. Chapter 12 the trip back to the bunker where my neighbors have been sheltering is a quick one, and the news of recent events arrives before me. I am received as a hero, which doesn't feel bad, but also isn't something I seek. It will blow over, I imagine, and I'm just glad we have survived what seemed like an impossible situation. We lost buildings, and sadly, we lost some individuals who did not make it underground before those buildings were crushed, but we did not lose our world. We did not lose our world, and we did not lose our faith. Through everything, we did not lose our faith. Say, we don't have to go back to school for the rest of the day, do we? Hal suddenly asks, bringing laughter even from the parents, who were so furious at his earlier actions, but who might now be glad they had raised a son willing to put his neck on the line when it counts. I smile. We'll have to ask Head Director Vitton. But I'd quite like the day off tomorrow, too. Did you really see one of them? Pip asks. One of the aliens? I nod and tell him all about the two eyes, the five-fingered hands, the sandy skin. You should paint it, he says. I will, I tell him. Something about my students' hearing was attuned to the sounds of the alien triangles passing overhead in recent nights in a way that mine and that of the other adults simply wasn't. And their brave insistence in the face of so many doubts gave us a chance to deal with all of this. If Pip, Hal, and the rest hadn't come forward, and I suppose if I hadn't believed and vouched for them, I wouldn't have been standing with Vitten when the mothership arrived. I wouldn't have had his ear. And who knows how he would have responded. I don't want to think about that. So I don't. We made it. 
Right now, nothing else matters. We all return to the surface soon after that, which is possible for us to do so quickly because our city was spared the damage some others withstood. The rebuild in some areas of our planet will be long and hard, but we will pull together. After an additional series of grateful comments from Vitten, who accompanies me to the surface despite living a great distance away, he surprises me with the offer of a deputy directorship, with fast-tracked potential for promotion even higher up the ranks. Sensing my hesitation, he adds another comment. The system should change, E.J., I agree, and change is better directed from within, so please give my offer some consideration. I will, I tell him, with the same assuredness as when I said the same thing to Pip regarding my painting of the alien. Because Vitten is right, change does happen from within, and I would always prefer to try to make things better than complain about them from a distance. Some say that you can't change a system before it changes you, but I have come to see the value of acting in good faith and putting my neck on the line. With that, Vitten returns underground, and I set off on the short walk home to rest my weary head, not to mention my weary legs and everything else. Hey, EJ, Hal's voice calls. I turn to see that he's broken away from his parents, Hal being Hal, and is running towards me. Yeah? He pauses to catch his breath. Well, I guess I kind of understand why those things left, but, well, why did they come? I don't know, I say, leveling with him. But they're gone, Hal. They're gone. He nods a few times, then smiles. I can't wait to see your painting, anyways. I mean, two eyes? Weirdest things ever, I tell him, then continue on my way. Both of the suns are getting ready to set at the same time, casting those beautiful shadows we only get every so often. But Hal's question sits stubbornly in my mind as I walk. Really, that question is the only thing in my mind, even as I get inside. And it keeps rattling around, even when night comes and I'm taking little Pip's advice to paint the best likeness I can. The alien bug driver's gaze is etched in my mind. Sad for its fallen comrade, but resistant of any potential urge to crush me in revenge. So why did they come? A big part of me hopes we'll never know, because I'm certainly not hoping for a return. As for my best guess, maybe they did something to their home planet, like when our ancestors almost destroyed ours. Maybe they came looking for a new home world. If they did, their short stop taught them one thing for sure. This one is already taken. Thank you for listening to Whence They Came, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by Jack DeGolia, text and production copyright 2021 by Craig Falconer, all rights reserved.